Hello, welcome very much. Today we talk about gender and language and the reason is that on the last book fair, the real one, the physical one, we had a panel discussion on gender and language and race and we only got to the N word and the promise was that on the next book fair we would continue the discussion and therefore we fulfilled the promise. Book fair, whether we'll have a physical one, we don't know, but there is gender and we talk about it. And for that purpose I have three guests or maybe only two, we don't know. All these guests have a gender or maybe not, we learned that. But all of them somehow deal with gender. I will introduce them with a short question and then we talk with each other about everything and in one hour we'll be through and need not make a promise to continue next time. First one, I would like to introduce Karen Nölle. Hello, Karen. Language is hierarchical, uh, first of all, but I have to start somewhere. Welcome very much. Karen Nölle is... Um, publisher with EDC5, but she is a translator, Doris Lessin, Janet Frame, and many other authors. And she's just translating Earth Like Hayley Grin. Did I pronounce it properly? Yes, I am relieved. Um, of the 90 books you have translated, about 80, 85 have been written by women. Why is that so? Well, when I started translating, I was uh, mid-30 and I had worked at the university for eight years already and translation was kind of a mental project for me. I started as a scientist just for reasons of need and uh, the first author I translate, Sarah Maintenant, uh, was, had a scientific uh, background working on female utopias. Then, well, I have a lot of respect for well-written stories and I plucked up the courage asking her whether I sh should uh, translate her stories and the Brown uh, Publishing House took it over. And based on this translation, it became known that I'm one of the women who did uh, translations not translating just uh, what uh, keeps, uh, what moves women, taking into translations. You can only translate what you perceive, what you realize. And s since I'm interested in the female element, it was in it. And so I got uh, contracts to translate women, Audrey Lord, Doris Lessing and so forth. And it took about 10 years. And I thought I should also be fair and translate men for a while, for a change, which I did for 10 years, and then return to the women folk. So it fits so well that next to you we have another writer, Nina George, or better, an international bestseller author, Nina George. You are president of the European Writers' Council and initiator of hashtag Women Count. What is that? 2016, I was asked, together with some other participants, to be, talk about women in culture and the media at, in a round table meeting with the State Minister of Culture. She put together a team of totally different associations uh, um, and uh, authors, and we sit, sat down and discussed what came out of a study. And then we want to show very clearly uh, not only there should be parity in uh, forming certain rounds of authors, but also regarding funding for monitoring. Monitoring does mean what? Well, monitoring means to use evidence-based uh, cases being put in studies in a representative way, showing how many women are there and there, how much do they earn here, how much do they earn there. So from the filter discrimination experience, we should get to evidence-based cases instead of uh, getting um, evidence-based uh, monetary funding. We didn't get it. And when I talked to Ms. Goethe, I said, well, we should uh, count women because uh, women count. And based on that, uh, we did the first pilot study together with the Rostock University. And we did the project through 31 days and we evaluated 62 media on the question, who is writing about whom and how long and how much, how broadly based do men talk about men and 
how much do women write about uh, books written by women, and then we made comparisons on that. Uh, based on this pilot study, many minor projects developed, and then there are so many different women also counting totally different things, counting how many times women are published in literature, uh, pub publishing houses, how often do they appear in literature, how many times are they recommended, how many they are involved in power in foreign, what about the art? That's interesting, because normally I sit there as the only woman on a panel, and this time it's about gender. Basically, a third one should sit here, Thomas Meinecke, but we had problems with technology. I don't want to joke about men and technology, because we want to move away from cliches. Um, maybe later on he can be switched in, but it's absolutely interesting. As soon as it's about gender, we've got the feeling women on the front, because as if only women had gender, you know, uh, my girlfriend takes care of that. Um, and something I found as well, you talked about it, I mean, we um, see each other, it's a wonderful situation in this post-digital era, we see each other, but not really, I see you, but you don't see that I see you. So it's a question to Karen once again. You said that you perceived certain things in texts that other translators, and I do it without the asterisks, probably it were men, that had um, these other translators had not perceived it and couldn't translate it. What was it, for example? Well, it was not only men. And sometimes it was very minor things because uh, women started in the 80s to narrate uh, stories from a new perspective. And if you do, didn't you use the harsh approach, then uh, these were uh, stories narrated in a subtle way. Something which uh, I found out because I wrote an article about it and which I translated was the thorn birds at the time where Colony Pallack uh, tr uh, tried to, to use a feminist touch of uh, popular novels being written, but in Germany it's not that feminist as in English. Uh, you, would, uh, you recall a lady wanted to get a bishop which she didn't get. She married someone and she forces him uh, to get a child by, of course, sexual intercourse. In English, he keeps biting on her teeth right through the end and in Germany only up to veneration and then only at the end again. And such scenes happen very many times also in more subtle context, but also in the perception of certain tendencies. We have something wonderful. Technology helped us to come together. We are not lonely. This is so nice. So let me interrupt and also welcome Thomas Meinecke. Uh, I told everything about you. I repeat it. No, don't That's do not necessary. <laughs> okay. Well, Thomas Meinecke. Um, at the latest with Tomboy, his novel, he dealt with the problem of gender, sex in all of his books, like um, Light Blue, uh, Virgin, etc. What I found interesting and what I mentioned before, it's so wonderful that a man sits on this panel discussion, because normally, as soon as we talk about gender, we pretend as if only women were affected. Gender? Only my women, my wife. I don't have any. Um, Thomas, do you identify yourself as a man? That's a highly interesting question, because about uh, tw uh, for, for 20 years I have been asked whether I identify as a woman, because for more than 20 years uh, in interviews uh, since I've written the novel Tomboy, under the influence, which I still feel, uh, in terms of deconstructive uh, feminism, I've been called and ca I called myself a feminist. And, well, I was considered pathological, whether I see myself rather as a woman. And at the time, I s thought uh, that you uh, could also appear like a kind of a lawyer or a communist without being a member of the Viking class. But throughout the decades, through which I have kept saying it, and now people don't ask me that much about 
in that strange undertone, how can you be a feminist as a man? Because this, as a man, as a provincial town hall also has come to know, because it has made its way uh, against the backdrop of uh, learned language regulations that uh, uh, gender is nothing uniform, just a relationship, a performance. And in the meantime, people have understood that I can be a feminist even as a man, and maybe it's not that important anymore anyway. So the question is, need I be a man to say I'm also a feminist? Because it can also be lost on the way in a pleasant way against the backdrop of such a more current orientation on the non-binary one, the two poles, uh, which are only seen as edges of a fluid space in which you move and in which the relationship between binary things is interesting instead of the essential one. Uh, that was it also about regarding Butler, but then it took its time before it became kind of a mainstream to talk about it. By the way, to respect uh, a colleague of mine, Anja Chuarasa, I wrote or talked about a beautiful anecdote about him. She was misgendered twice, I'm surprised. I'm always misgendered, only once, by an editor of... Um, um, uh, a publisher, and then she wrote back uh, and says, Dear Mr. Amya, and I said, Sorry, I'm a woman. And then uh, Juris Butler wrote back in a few minutes later, Sorry, Anya, I always had problems with gender. And since that, um, she's falling in love with him. Um, a question to the three of you Have you been misgendered once? Well, I was even called Mr. Professor because I had my own doctor title. In my case, it started in school. My first day of school, I was so happy. Nina Gorga was called, and I got up and stood in front of the headmaster, and she looked down to me. She said, you are not Nina Gorga, you are a boy. And for one moment, I was not sure whether she was right. So <clears throat> I... Uh, questioned that till I was 16. Well, in my case, and I've, I've never beaten up anyone up to now, about which I'm happy and proud, I ha was no typical boy, the entire principle of comparing one's strengths, of being faster and stronger, that was never clear to me, and I played as much w with uh, girls as with boys, and uh, even when I was uh, deemed a girl, it didn't shock me. I realized that it's not so easy to become a man, and I also talk as a father of a daughter. Maybe it's even more difficult uh, than for a girl to become a woman, because they really feel it completely if they want to reach uh, positions as adults, which they are not allowed to reach. But uh, being a boy it was not so easy, but I came to grips with that, and now uh, I perform this uh, male life model without really living it. Even now, I have an ideal, if when talking about male hill, this is rather an in, in male called maleness. I ask that because I try to have it un explained by a grammar theoretician, you know, with a name. I mean, um, a Me Too is not gendered, but in Bengali, people don't know. Um, what it is, every letter of every authority would say, um, uh, dear Mr. Mitu Sanda. Um, and the reason is when the grammar books were written, they all referred to Latin language. In, in Latin, the explanation was that male is the most valuable gender, then um, the female, and then uh, the neutral. Yeah? And Rex Irregina Beate, you know, the dignified um, gods and goddesses. Then the gender um, would refer to the king, otherwise uh, the king would be offended and um, um, the queen uh, is happy that she has this female gender. Um, 
Thomas, we talked about it before. We said basically in Germany we have a single gender. We use the male one and the female one is the deviation. At least it's perceived that way. Can you explain that? It's no question, but talk to me, please. Yes. It's also interesting regarding the names. The name of my daughter is Juno, and now there are a few of them. I mean, there have been Junos for thousands of years, but in the classical repertoire of education, people thought it's like Kuno, Bruno, so it need to be a boy. And uh, so they were asking, why is Juno? In male terms. Now, we know some kids who have that name, and uh, while well, it's always uh, oftentimes linked with the ending of the name. Uh, so the one gender, well, that is something which is highly interesting. Also in Judith Butler, where I read it first at the middle of the 90s, namely that there's only one place from which people are talking, and uh, that is in a masculine territory. All the rest is the other one, and those are the women as the other ones, also in terms of pathological finding of being different, also in the context of uh, actually positive things uh, like the uh, Enlightenment in the French Revolution, where uh, people were not allowed to vote and were patho pathologized, genealogy, kino uh, genealogy, uh, gave them this notion, so it was always uh, that location which was cemented by the language. There is sort of saying by Louise Push some decades ago, all people become uh, sisters, which sounds strange to us still, but all people become brothers, that is written everywhere and taken for granted. So if you realize that language is not fair, standing in the middle, involving all agendas, you realize that there's only one position, namely the power position of the male language, relegating women to the place of the other one or to the pathological realms. So there we still have to cover quite a distance. And for you as a translator, that is also a highly interesting field because it also reaches into the various languages in different ways. And then you see how you can move something or not move something because it's not possible in terms of languages. So this political aspect uh, can be resolved on the level of languages. Maybe it's even taken too important, but it need to be analyzed and then asking what we can do and then go about it accordingly. As an author, I try to learn from positions which are not characterized by a central, massive, monolithic male subject, and then uh, this takes me to the later novels of women of the 18th century. Uh, Marginalized women, because um, they uh, developed uh, certain concepts uh, out of sheer necessity. Also, the dissociated nature of not being allowed to one's own location, being allowed to talk in one's own way as a woman. So as an author, maybe this uh, enables me to understand the word better and phrasing helps for a better word. For a long time it was said that gender somehow is male. Respectively, this is true for all genders. I mean all of them. And then in America, for example, women tried to um, get into certain professions. You know, lawyer, everyone can become that, is written by the law, and it was meant uh, for us as well, especially when they wanted to elect, because man was all humans, you know. No, man only means all humans if it's about paying taxes or going into prisons. Uh, but apart from that, man means man. Um, and therefore, one of the motivations of the women's movement in the 70s and 80s last century in feminist uh, linguistics, uh, Louise Push, you mentioned, to make women visible. You know, if we have a group of 99 people and 98 of them are female and one is male, then we still use the collective male um, noun. Cannot be. And once again, a question to Karen Nölle. How did you do that? How did you perceive that, that women are, are to be made visible? For me, it was a relief. All of a sudden, I felt addressed by many texts. 
texts, to reading texts by women, if you didn't have lessons at school on it, that is exciting and interesting for a start, because those are totally different stories you get to read. For, as a, for me, as a translator, that was interesting to make these experiments, uh, looking at the experiments made by women, just saying, I want to become visible, listen to me, I'm also around. Uh, that, but that does not suffice by telling stories with surprising moments as well, which is not possible in English because I translate from English. But there it's easy because a word like scientist, doctor, is not uh, linked to gender terms. So you can play around with that, thinking for quite a while as a reader, oh, that's uh, the role of a man. And then on page 10, it's a woman all of a sudden. And, uh, well, you find out as a reader what that means for your own perception, how it develops, and that there are other possibilities to read to take a look at it. At the moment, I'm working on a text, uh, for example, a text which I need to hand in for quite a while, as a little queen uh, on a planet uh, where all couples uh, are uh, for all of them together, one in the morning, one in the evening, then it's broken up because uh, one day they move to a mountain and people find him or her quite attractive and then on page 10 it becomes apparent it's a woman and then two women form the morning couple and they must not uh, tell about it uh, through the evening couple and vice versa. So the pro productive uh, tension that for pages would think, well, um, a woman and a man are together, but then it's woman plus woman. And that's what was considered quite exciting in the 80s. The question, to what extent this is uh, normal, uh, I don't know, but uh, quite little happened in the scope with uh, traditional perception. Well, Kali Gibbon, um, has uh, proposed um, the I as a neutral, the E, uh, uh, instead of he or she, only the E to be taken. But she also then opted for they, that is the plural, in the singular. Um, and, and she said it's absurd um, uh, that people say that's wrong ram grammar um, is not according to grammar rule, although um, since 1400 you can see that it has been used that way. I, I don't know, it has been proven in the English language for so long. They use it already. Um, and we don't know yet uh, whether they are male or female, and we don't want to determine yet. And that's interesting, and the question goes to Nina George. Um, the um, unconscious um, ideas that we have of gender, like once we change language, oftentimes, you know, you have an idea. Uh, we talked about that before. You said you were in Poland where um, it's self-understood. Can you explain it to us? I had the honor as a European Writers' Council president to talk at an economic summit in Poland. I was a quota woman there. Uh, out of uh, 100 participants, 90 were men, 10 were women. And there was a panel on women in companies in leading positions. And there were all those great women sitting there, which, where they were sitting because they had worked their way up. And they ag agreed with a male a moderator who said, well, women cannot so easily make their way. They're rather making compromise. And they thought, and they said mostly, yes, yes. Well, whilst I thought, no, no. So there are stereotypes in terms of gender seemingly assigned to um, a gender in a repetitive way without realizing what was the actual truth. And here, at least in the past 10 to, 20, 10 to 20 years, we can at least imagine that there's not a typical masculine or feminist behavior, but it's just a sign to the gender roles. And then it's connotated differently. Vera comes to my mind time and again in terms of uh, birth-based uh, gender. It was a boy, now it's a girl. It's Vera now. And she's reproached time and again that she's so dominant. And she told me, well, when I was still a male, was never reproached to be a man. But on the other hand, they said, you are strong, you are, you like to take decisions. And then in male-based uh, 
uh, agenda, but then moving to a woman, I was connotated and evaluated differently, which I think is sad and exciting at the same time, and we'll see what comes out of it. Precisely, very long in linguistic feminism we thought or appeal to ourselves, you have to talk like men, you have to um, bring your opinion across. Um, like tech question, you know, um, at the end of the sentence, you know, where you affirm and make contact again, you know. Um, this is connotated negative and female, but we know today, no, that's not true. This is how communication works. We reassure that the other one has understood and only in such a way can we really communicate and language, if it has a female connotation, it's degraded having a lower value. So the one question was making women more visible in the 70s, 80s, that was strong. As of the 90s, it was rather the point that we would like to dissolve different gender or having different brackets, not only two genders here being made visible. Thomas, in your books, you try to do that precisely, um, like genders uh, and diversity showing that. How do you do that with language? Well, I try to do it in terms of language in a way in which uh, I do away with this male know-it-all attitude, rather trying out, asking questions, trying to uh, strike compromises, uh, focusing on reception instead of focusing on the act of creation and creating where everything appears in a closed male uh, why, as an author, uh, if I read the text of Ellen Sixus about uh, female writing in her, well, uh, it is quite irritating for a start that this is attached to the sense of feeling lust. With all these women, lips that talk to each other. Lips talk. Well, and all this uh, jouissance problem of feeling lust is also a male fantasy. Of course it's there, but the way in which males describe it, it's not the true. And then Alan Sixou describes it, and she says it's like the female writing can be. And then as a man, for a start, I questioned this, uh, wh whether I can relate this to myself. And then she said about herself, uh, Joyce also can it, and in D.H. Lawrence, there's a female organism, which is true, uh, which I wouldn't dare say or think as a man. And uh, in contrast to the idea that female writing, which empowers itself or emancipates itself uh, in terms of uh, male type writing, or just like with the silly ideas of this close nature of writing. And I won't say I'm against Alice Schwarzer, but I'm not against that uh, women should join the federal arm, but that no one should join it. So and not everything needs to be taken off over by the speaking act of men, and Sue is a great theoretician getting closer to those things. I also read from and le learned from Sylvia Bovinchen, authors who dedicated themselves to such uh, theories. And I like to read such books. Uh, maybe it's also the Günther Rode of Bettina von Arnim, who created something like that in terms of this uh, situation of uh, misery, saying uh, that uh, people shouldn't write novels, but if they do so, it appears they are hysterical. So all of these things, to, for me, have a positive connotation, and I try to orient myself to that in a questioning, um, trying out uh, why thinking along, Working on it, which is a bit, little bit more strenuous, but uh, has n not these great uh, clues, but it's quite interesting, and it helps me to think about it while writing. And I also like to read uh, the uh, prefaces of uh, female authors. I also recall the book by Jean-Luc Nancy saying there is uh, sexual intercourse after which I had said there's no intercourse, and Judith Kasper, the translator of the book, d d dealt with the question how to translate 
rapport sexuel, sexual intercourse. And what about the uh, German? What if I uh, turn sexual intercourse from this uh, rapport? This uh, contributes bucolic uh, grotesque elements. And of course, you are in translation anyway, which opens up a new space as compared to the so-called original, and uh, then you even may focus on it. Moving in such a delicate space, uh, uh, well, it's really highly interesting. So uh, reading about that in the concluding statements of the uh, translators, well, this makes clear how, as writing people, we need to decide all the while how to include. For a long time, I was very much influenced by Helen Sixu, and I noticed that this brought me to the situation that I stopped writing, because they had the female writing aspect, you know, that means before we go into the patriarchal word of giving it names, you know, etc. And then I, I remain silent, you know, uh, which is a female connotation, so we can stop totally. But what I regard interesting, I always look in this direction, sorry, Karen, um, before we talked about it, when we look from role models, then we also look outside Europe. There are so many languages where it is self-understood to have uh, three genders. Like in India, you have um, men, women, and Kidras. Um, that was before Vedian times, so many, many hundred years ago. And you uh, told me that in Africa, with the Ibu, there are male daughters and female husbands. Can you tell me about that? Well, I'm not an uh, ethnologist, and it's a long time since I've translated that book. But at least there's a female anthropologist, a Nigerian, uh, rejecting what uh, certain uh, peoples have been described in Nigeria in the eyes of Western anthropologists. And therefore, she took this accentuated title, because as in many other uh, countries of the world, there are situations in families in which certain children, uh, uh, boys are turned into uh, girls in their social roles, and then it was taken for granted that the uh, biological gender only is identical with the other gender, only in certain situations. The fact that it's so difficult to imagine this variety is the atypical aspect, the embarrassing one, what, the thing which um, represents the Western countries or the societies characterized in the scientific way in the past 200 years. And it's hard to get to that concept. Um, it's always that we say, okay, we politize language too much. Okay, it is political, but it's the other way around. Language has always been political. Language clustered people always, gave it a room, gave them a room, and broke um, the lines up between the rooms. And you gave a beautiful example, Karen, of the Encyclopedia Britannica, where um, uh, you found women and Aborigines in Australia. Well, it was in the early times as a scientist when I was looking for orientation because I couldn't accept the male discourse. So I started in Berkeley for a while in a sitting room. There was a large Encyclopedia Britannica where I looked up each and everything I wanted to know about. And uh, I found that, that in 1957, the edition, the women, no, the Aborigines came under fauna and flora, whilst the... Uh, the or women came under animals, so it, it was nice. To, it was nice to read about this in this outspoken way. And new statements in the, the 18th century was also interesting to read because uh, the liberal capitalism was described very nicely there. And when it is taken for granted, this is not unveiled anymore at all. And this uh, Encyclopedia Britannica shows very clearly what it's like, what it means, and from which position, from which assessment, women 
and non-white uh, need to free themselves to be seen and counted at all. In the 19th century, there were grammar discussions saying that race, gender is the Trump. Uh, black and not white people are it, yeah? Neutral and commodities somehow. Uh, in order to justify exploitation, grammar, justification for exploitation. Grammar is not separate from reality. Now, the German Duden decided that the gender asterisk is not uh, allowed but not prohibited any longer. Uh, Nina, would you use the gender asterisk in literary text? How do you deal with gender? And, well, if it's not clear, how do you deal with that in your texts? Well, in my case, it's always clear. Uh, that's uh, the, the nice thing that you can decide what you are talking about and w w which perspective you uh, assign to the other person throughout the story. That is wonderful. And in the Schönheit der Nacht, the beauty of the night, that's a novel. There are two um, male figures, uh, women, mid 40 and 19 talking permanently about their identities. They think about and act it, act about it in those terms. And identity does not only start from the gender, because identity is also something subjective, because it also means uh, that one's identity is pressed into a structure from the outside world, where if I'm seen as a woman, I'm subjected to marginalization. But if I'm seen as a scientist or as a professor, then the evaluation of my identity is um, linked to totally different factors. And uh, once I got the fun, I discovered seven uh, spots uh, where uh, my main figures uh, consider a certain uh, number. And uh, the number of people, when it comes to identity, they don't want to be pressed into non-binary gender f shapes, others which don't orientate to certain gender aspects, be it socialized or not. For example, if you consider myself first, then I think, first of all, Nina, author, female author. Uh, that is my identity. After that, woman, yes, of course. I discovered seven uh, places where I found uh, forms where I didn't take the gender asterisk, but I uh, let my main characters uh, zoom in. They say, can say male or female student or students in general, because to some it's not even clear what they are, who they are. Am I a man? Or am I a woman? Do you want to become successful? Do you want to be subjected to certain structures or other people? Or people talk about this in on the beach, if they want to be pressed into drawers. One is married, other, the other one is the new friend of the son. No. And I don't uh, and, uh, tell the story how the woman uh, gets closer to the husband. No, they talk about it and discover limits they want to overcome and they don't want to be pressed in uh, drawers and they want to be, don't want to be called queer or female or male. Or I let others reflect upon someone who dressed as a male person for three weeks because I enjoy totally differently to sit differently to uh, uh, you know, to order a beer and I enjoy situations in which uh, I observe men who see women in men's clothes and uh, well I know what they want. And I can talk about this, I can write about it. I don't need an asterisk for it. I can talk about identities, trans identities, identities on a way, identities beyond the gender realm. And that is uh, extremely practical because you can just write about it. Sorry for the long contribution. This is absolutely right. This is what we want. Martin Buber quite nicely said that in the word you, it also means that the you is always bigger than the I. You is more the identity, gender, uh, class. Um, the you um, shows that all creatures are in one person. Uh, what would be a utopia for you with respect to language and gender? Do we want to get to a situation that like the 
English language, which is not marking gender, presumably, or rather the German, which is very clear. Men, women, and um, people where we don't know yet what gender we want to give it and how to call it. What would be a way for you that you regard most productive? It's a way in which we are moving. I'm optimistic by nature because many of the things which have been mentioned by me, by you, point to the fact that it's a long road to hoe in which we find ourselves. Considering that race and gender come under flora and fauna, Aborigines, and if I think further back, when the uh, slave uh, upheavals took place in San Domingo and uh, the French uh, parliament released uh, the slaves. But in, in hindsight, we couldn't uh, uh, judge it uh, or uh, penalize the fact that it took place in this way because people are still considered objects instead of subjects. So it's a very protracted, uh, protracted process. I recall how difficult it was 30 years ago still to to describe a trans person or transvestite in uh, female terms, saying, well, she, he looks really nice in her dress, in his dress, in her dress. So it's hard to address someone in male or female terms in the light of what you see in a certain moment. So these are very slow, protracted processes. And uh, vis-a-vis -vis much younger f male and female fans, I cause uh, irritation and uh, say in a straight remark, oh, he's um, gay, by the way, whilst to me it's rather positive. And in the time when gay males were outed and this was considered a progressive uh, step, because briefly before they were still criminalized. So these are very slow processes. And then suddenly it was a liberating uh, step to say I'm gay or you are gay. And now I sometimes say, I have uh, female friends around 30 asking, how do you say that? How you say, why do you say he's gay? So this tells me we are on a way where I shouldn't say it anymore at all because it doesn't mind, it doesn't matter anymore. So I re reclaim this in an elated way and uh, I've been um, influenced by gay subcultures whilst beach, disco, high game, and uh, being influenced by that does not mean at all that you constantly call it the other one. So uh, we gradually abandon these concepts, and uh, it doesn't matter whether you are male or female, even in terms of my self-description and my social everyday life, as has been described, uh, as uh, Nina said, uh, where you feel duty differently if you perform in a certain way. But basically, uh, I'm in the privileged role as a man out there on the street, and I realize that the attribute a German doesn't mean anything to me, uh, except through the Shoah, because I know that I'm German, because there was the Shoah and the generations of my parents and grandparents who forced it through, and that is my identity, so to say, but only for that reason. Otherwise, I don't care at all to be German, and even male. So it's a process in terms of language, relieving itself from a ballast, a burden. And these uh, withdrawal uh, fights of those feeling threatened by that, the entire discourse on gender apt language, the many uh, withdrawal uh, struggles of the patriarchate, patriarchate, which are ugly in the daily appearance. But we are indeed on the way to an ideal, or let's say to a better world regarding this misinterpretation and misperception. What would be for you, you know, I, I would like to say a lot about it. I, I 
uh, think it's really important that I'm a woman. Uh, it's not that I don't care, but I care a lot in, in a lot of situations. Um, at certain situations, you know, I meet people where this is not the most important identity criterion. But then I would like to enjoy a lot of fun with my gender, but you're not allowed to do so. Yeah, great, discover my gender. Um, yeah, this is a question that I wanted to ask you, Karin, but I, I really have to say that. Um, how do you deal with all these words? My, you said homosexuality uh, has been criminalized for a long time. That's true, but only with respect to men, because lesbian women, um, um, they, they said they didn't have any sexuality. What do they do in bed? Just hold hands? No, it's not important. Nazis, um, um, you know, brought lesbians into concentration camps. Um, but apart from that, in German legislation, lesbians didn't accept because there was no female sexuality. How do you deal um, with a term like penetration? You know, that's the penis that penetrates. Um, there, there are also other proposals like uh, seclusion or um, having no children, you know, childless. Um, a woman is not set free of children, but childless. A man who doesn't have children is called a man. Um, um, how would you use it in translation? How do you deal with that? As a female translator, I depend on what the authors offer, fortunately, and I take the freedom I need. I, I'm writing, a, uh, translating an essay um, about a child which is called child or her. Uh, the child is always female. And then at the end of the article, you may find out uh, that this is not really the case. So I, all, I do everything within a certain framework. I also discussed with a translator at length years ago that uh, uh, male always uh, wanted to say her and she always wanted to write us. So uh, if you want uh, something, that, then it's considering language in motion. And with a language in motion, uh, our perception is also in motion. So we should also learn to listen better and more, to have fewer prejudice-based concept if we think in terms of male or female or trans. So we need a new link for that purpose, and then maybe even new uh, wordings, new translations, new forms of distinguishing need to be considered. Yeah, this is it precisely. We can start sentences with and, and that was impossible for a long time. Or we can just start a new sentence in the middle of the other sentence, so it dissolves that way. Well, all dissolutions are great. Something which is highly exciting and not easy is the fact that we still have this preaching, uh, preaching to the converted, those who are, are thinking about having fun, developing things, different perspectives and opinions, opening the world against those who don't want to hear us. So they're still very good in closing their ears, and they are not very good either in opening their ears. And being able to open, to open ears is great. Nina, what do you think about opening the ears? What would be your utopia? Well, and I would say it forces uh, open doors. Now I got the uh, and at the beginning. Let me come back to what the Weltempfang uh, means to us, certainly the most surprising one within the scope of the Buchmesse. And that's also the fact that we find ourselves in the center of Europe. i come to opening ears in a moment. Well, Europe for us is diverse, and uh, we have fields of uh, uh, rest rest reflection and different experience on discrimination. And 
in order to open ears, you need to sort out certain things first, because there are the fields of uh, restriction or opening when it uh, comes to situations like in Hungary or Poland, where, for example, sexual sexuality, in, whichever terms, female, male, or trans, uh, this is always linked to experience of restriction or discrimination, even including violence and prohibitions and punishment, whilst in other countries there are fields of discrimination which are related to the non-binary element in male and female terms, behind which power-based structures are standings, and these are totally different spaces within which you need to move, need to understand, listen and act to it, react to it in a certain way, and this also includes language and interpretation. Lukashenko, for, for example, acts against the democracy movement in Belarus, reproaching them of a certain wording as, uh, against people who stand up for democratic uh, movements. And there are many reproaches by the people still in power uh, against this kind of wording. Hence, the blame uh, using a certain wording can also be used as an instrument of uh, power to repress certain things. So before opening our ears, we need to open our eyes, differentiating whether it's about uh, gender, is it's about the language and wording. Oh, and we need to talk about things in a way we want to talk about, opening fields for discourse for those standing on the same side, for example, those attending the wonderful uh, panel, panel situation of the Buchmesse. In ideal terms, we are on the same intellectual side, but on different levels of vocabulary and observation development. So words like uh, cis or women I have not yet included in my vocabulary. I need to listen first in discourses. And I would say then neither losers nor winners who is right in determining a new kind of vocabulary. Hence, keeping our ears open of uh, areas of discourse in, instead of considering things in a Jacobinian notion, saying I'm right. And therefore, I'm ro this ro moving on the right. Such a beautiful left. closing word. You cannot add any point. So let's stay in discourse. Um, there is nothing worse to use the wrong uh, word. What is worse is not talking to each other, and language lives from movement. I love you all. It's so wonderful to talk to you. Thank you very much.